Welcome and thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, an issue that's near and dear to my heart and to my practice. Um, again, my name is Chris Smith. I'm a family law attorney in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And uh, what I am really excited to talk about today is, is educating the issue on the issue of whether um, there's a real impact on children uh, if they don't have a co-parenting relationship or a relationship with both parents that um, will facilitate uh, their well-being moving forward. I, I think we get into the weeds a lot of times on best interests of children, and we miss a lot of the research that's been done and a lot of the information relating to the importance of both parents uh, and the fact that both parents matter in the lives of their children. And so uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. And as many of us know, and if you're watching this, you probably have been educated from uh, educated by other videos and other presentations from people and doctors who are much more uh, knowledgeable about this topic than I am. And so uh, go back and uh, listen to them as well as do the research. I've got uh, plenty of resources. If at the end of it, you want to reach out to me, feel free to. Uh, your, my information will be available. And I'm happy to share the citations and the support and the documentation that I'm going to reference in this talk uh, so that you can go do your own research on the topic. Because I know a lot of times there are attorneys especially are guilty of throwing stuff out there and and you know maybe not being able to to back it up with the academic uh, support but what I'm going to try to do uh, is only reference those things that are uh, we can cite to uh, and have been referenced in other materials uh, by other people so uh, let's just jump in and and I think we're all in agreement that for years um, the research on the topic of, of uh, parent-child relationships supports and demonstrates that both um, parents are essential in the well-being of, of their children. Uh, there's, there's ample research on the topic, uh, which states that both caregivers and all caregivers in the lives of, a ch of the child uh, are central to the foundation of the development of that child. And especially during the early years uh, when parents have the most influence on a child's development. Um, I, I've heard it said that children learn how to love from how we love them. And so, especially at that uh, very young age of birth to five years old or even up to eight years old, those are very critical times for both parents to have a relationship with their child or their children, uh, because that's when you're going to get that, uh, that bonding time, the child's going to develop a lot of the psychological markers that we're going to talk about, and there's going to be the most opportunity for uh, doing good by your child by developing a relationship at, in those early years. And so those early years are so critical. Um, after eight, those years become, uh, are still very critical in terms of the development uh, because we know that the child's brain isn't stopped, hasn't stopped developing for uh, up until, you know, into their twenties. And so we want to continue that relationship. Our topic today as it relates to parental alienation is relevant because what we're talking about is what happens to the child if you're going to tear that relationship apart. And so if you are a father uh, or even a mother and you're being pulled away from a child, you as the father are going to experience a lot of trauma as a, as a, results, as a result of not having that relationship, but there's also going to be a significant impact on the child. And that gets lost in the discussion a lot of times, I think, because we ignore the impact on the child. We talk about the impact on parents, parents' rights, constitutional protections, due process. We talk about those things as attorneys, especially, uh, but we oftentimes don't talk enough about the impact on children if a parent is pulled out of their life. And that's what we're talking about with, with parental alienation. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the history of where we are today as a society as it relates to parents first. Um, I saw a statistic 
that between 1960 and 2015, the percentage of children uh, and youth under the age of 18 who lived with two married parents, whether it be biological, non-biological, or adoptive, uh, that number decreased from approximately 85% to 65%. So between 1960 and 2015, the number of children who are living with two parents married in a home has decreased by 20%. Uh, in 2014, 7% of children lived in households headed by a grandparent. Uh, that number was only 3% in 1970. So what we're seeing is a, a rapid shift in the relationships that children are uh, being attached to when they're young, the relationships in the home. Uh, and so we, we have to be mindful of the fact we're in a shifting societal narrative as it relates to families. There's evidence that when parents live apart, uh, children generally benefit uh, if they have supportive relationships with both parents. And that's what happens in the case of a divorce. Uh, yet there's too often minimal focus uh, on the father-child relationship beyond the father's economic capacity to support the child. That's what we see a lot when we're talking to clients or we're talking to parents or fathers who are going through the family law process too often they feel like the only thing that is really asked of me as a father is that I pay my child support on time and that I'm supporting my family and that that's the only thing that's that that they want from me um but we know that that's the children need more so much more than just a support check um in recent years fathers who live with their children have become more involved in their lives uh, they're spending more time with them. They're taking part in more activities, um, in a greater variety of activities. It's not just coaching t-ball. Um, dads are taking kids to gymnastics classes or dance classes or music lessons or school drop-offs and pickups. Uh, they're making breakfast and packing lunches and and cooking dinner, and they're they're just more significantly in twined in the daily lives of their children if they're living in the home. Uh, however, um, the share of those fathers who are living in the home has fallen significantly in the last 50 years. And so we have to we have to look at those in that impact. Um, only 20% of fathers living away from their children um, are actually visiting their children more than once a week. Okay, so I, I want to repeat that. Uh, this is a statistic that uh, is the most discouraging, I think, for a family law attorney who represents a lot of dads, and that's that only 20% of dads who are not living in the home with their kids all get to see their kids every week. 80% of dads living away from their children or living apart from their children uh, do not get to see their kids on a weekly basis. And so maybe they have every other week visitation maybe they have they're only seeing their children a few times a year um, too many a larger percentage than I would like to admit are not seeing their children at all in fact one in four so about 25% uh, of dads who are not living in the home with their kids say they don't even see their children for, on a yearly basis okay so one in four don't see their kids at all um, as I said earlier father's times been caring for their children has risen gradually over the last two decades. Um, so whereas in 1975, when uh, my generation's parents were coming, uh, becoming parents, uh, only about 2.7 hours uh, a week was spent between father and child. So about two and a half hours a week was the father spending with the children. Um, that number grew a little bit in the 80s up to three three hours a week and then it just skyrocketed and doubled more than doubled uh, in 2000 between 85 and 2000 that number doubled and i think it's continuing to grow as we go so it more than six and a half uh seven hours a week our parent our father's spending with their children uh today so we're seeing statistically if you look at just time use data that married fathers are spending much more time with their children than their fathers did a generation ago. Um, however, the public um, the public perception 
is that fathers are are have not taken on a more prominent that they're they're not doing anything more really than their fathers did um and so the 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 statistics and the data suggest fathers are doing more as it relates to their relationship with their kids society is saying no they're not and so we're what we're i'm afraid we're seeing too often is that the legal system is following that societal trend where they're believing that fathers uh, are not spending that significant time and you may ask and you may seem it may seem like i'm talking a lot about dads uh, because when and i am because when we're talking about parental alienation um the vast majority of the time you're seeing father be the target parent who's being alienated now it absolutely happens that moms are are alienated as well uh, and that they're the target parents on occasion but the vast majority of the time father is the target parent so when i'm talking about alienation a lot of times i'm going to talk about um, the impact on fathers and fathers relationship with their kids and so um so as we set the tone for what we're talking about here um, I want to be able to say, okay, societally speaking, fathers are spending much more time with children in married homes. However, our society is not giving them the credit for that. Uh, and they society is not recognizing the growth in the role that fathers are playing inside the home, uh, while at the same time, they're expecting the same performance of fathers outside the home and there there we'll get into those some of those issues but um but it's it's critical to think about the fact that fathers are expanding their role in the home uh as time goes by um and i think that's there's a correlation between the time that most fathers are stepping up and putting more time in at home and the fact that mothers uh, often are being asked to uh, work outside the home and go get a job. And so that that correlation should, there should be a little balance there. And I think we're seeing some of that. Um, but what we're not seeing is the the correlation of recognition of fathers when it comes to uh, their legal rights to custody of their children. So uh, fathers are making a positive impact. Um, we're going to talk about the fact that positive, that those positive impacts by dad greater trust and empathy, higher scores on math and science, uh, higher IQs, lower suicide rates, increased psych psychological issues uh, if they don't have a relationship with dad, you know, less drug use, lower rates of asthma, lower teen pregnancy rates, lower crime rates. These are all things that you can point to and say there is a direct correlation between a, a strong relationship with dad and these issues, okay? greater trust and empathy, higher math and science scores, higher IQ, lower suicide rates. Um, in fact, I've seen one study that would, would suggest that nothing contributes more to suicide rates of both sexes than living in a mother-only home and not having a relationship with that. Um, it's a scary statistic when you think about the, the rates of suicide and where they're heading and the fact that uh, the rates of father-led homes is going the other direction as well, uh, and the suicide correlation between the two. So, um, and then if you look at just crime rates as well, overwhelming numbers of arsonists, rapists, and murderers uh, on a juvenile level are from father-absent homes. And so the, the conversation is one that is extreme in terms of its impact, because there are a few things that I think are probably going to create more societal impact than creating a, an environment in which mother and father understand their equal roles in terms of their impact on children. Um, so let's talk about parental alienation, topic that gets discussed a lot. Um, what is parental alienation? I, I'm going to refer to parental alienation as uh, one parent intentionally or even unintentionally manipulating a child to reject uh, fear or have a negative opinion of the other parent, the target parent. Uh, it's typical that parental alienation occurs in high conflict divorces or separations. Um, hostility, hostility and animosity between the parents is pretty common. 
uh, and it can have a significant impact on the child's relationship with the target parent, um, which in the end has an overall impact on the child's well-being. So uh, signs of parental alienation, let's talk about the things that we look at. We're going to look at bad mouthing. If one parent is consistently speaking negative about the other parent in front of the child, uh, they make derogatory comments, they're spreading false information, they're undermining the other parent's authority. I'll tell you just anecdotally, this sign of parental alienation begins prior to the divorce actually being filed. Um, you'll start to see it, I think, before the parent or before the parent separates from the other parent. It's not something that typically starts. Uh, after uh, only after the parent has filed for divorce, but it's something that begins in the home prior to the separation occurring between the parents. And so you've got one parent who's consistently uh, derogatory towards the other one in front of the children, making comments, making statements, uh, calling them names, uh, cussing at them, doing things that are just derogatory towards that other parent in front of the children. That is a sign of attempted alienation, and it starts before you even file the divorce paperwork. So that's one sign. Uh, another sign is limiting contact between parent and child and restricting or limiting the, the opportunity for the parent and the child to interact. Uh, limiting access to the child to the child by the other parent, denying visitation, manipulating the schedule, reducing uh, time spent with the target parent. A lot of times this shows up in the form of a parent creating a, an excuse for why a parent shouldn't get to see another parent. Uh, maybe there's an allegation of uh, drug use or an allegation of uh, alcohol abuse. I've seen uh, situations in which a parent may have had an alcohol or uh, problem at some point in the marriage. He goes to rehab while the marriage is still intact, gets out of rehab, does not have any signs of, of any, having any substance abuse issue post rehab, and then his alcohol uh, use becomes an issue in an emergency motion by mother and as a basis for trying to keep the father away from the kids and the court bought it and and so there there's usually a, a something where a parent creates a basis for limiting contact whether it's a substance issue that's not there whether it's a threat of abuse whether it's what a lot of us refer to as the silver bullet of sexual abuse allegations there's something there to create a basis for limiting contact um, there's alienating language child may start using words or phrases that are beyond their age level. Uh, they may express a negative opinion that they've never expressed before towards the targeted parent. They may reject grandparents. Um, got a case where you've got kids who had a good relationship with both parents, both grandparents, then the divorce is filed and you've got the kids rejecting uh, not only dad, but rejecting dad's parents as well who've done nothing but be great grandparents to the kids. And so you'll start to see some of that, uh, that rejection in the language. It sounds rehearsed. Uh, it sounds scripted. Uh, this, is, this is evidence of an alienating parent's influence on the children. Um, we talked about false allegations, that silver bullet uh, that, that is referred to by many. Uh, I think that we are seeing more allegations of abuse in more cases. I, I think a lot of states, uh, I know where I practice, the state has passed a law that would uh, allow for attorney's fees to be paid in the event of uh, in a family law case in which there's abuse allegations and a finding of abuse. So it, it motivates someone to make an allegation from a financial perspective because you've got a basis for it but also there's a there's there is a leverage point that allegations of abuse create for the uh, the person alleging it and so false allegations are not uncommon it does not mean that allegations of abuse are not valid it does not mean that there are not legitimate issues relating to abuse that need to be addressed 
but it is not you cannot deny the fact that allegations of abuse are all too commonly false in family law settings and so uh it's a it's a mechanism for someone to try to keep a parent away or to try to gain leverage within the, the family law case um one of the things you look for emotionally and psychologically with a child who's been alienated is a lack of empathy or um, just an irrational hostility towards the targeted parent that lack of empathy or 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 hostility is going to show itself and it's going to be something that you probably have not seen before in that child and something that does not um is not justified by any of the behavior of the parent and so it's going to it's it's one of those things that you know it when you see it and so it, be on the lookout for that so um those are some of the signs that we look at the consequences of parental alienation can be severe uh, as we know both parents uh, the targeted parent and the child can have can be negatively impacted and so uh, the child who is being put into this position may experience emotional distress confusion uh, the damaged relationship of a parent. Uh, they may, may struggle with issues uh, such as low self-esteem, depression, anxiety, uh, even difficulty forming healthy relationships in the future. And so the targeted parent, this, this is an emotionally devastating thing for them. This is, you're, you're essentially taking a child and turning that child on that parent and making that parent feel uh, rejected there's a feeling of loss, there's extreme frustration, uh, but that child is also in the position of being put into a place where they're, they're not going to develop uh, the way that they could. And so it is a form of child abuse. I will always uh, hold to the fact that parental alienation is a form of child abuse and should be treated as such. Because if you just look at the, the statistics, Children are negatively impacted by parental alienation, especially when they don't have a relationship with dad, because we can look at the, the empirical data of children who do not have a relationship with dad. And that empirical data is what we're going to use to show the best interest of children is to have a relationship with both mom and dad. Both parents matter. And so when we look at that, we, we're, we're empirically able to establish that children who have been alienated from father and do not have a significant relationship with father, and that alienation can come in various forms. We're going to talk about it, and it's the subject of uh, that I'm going to talk about at the conference later in the year, and that's the fact that maybe a parent is not the alienating party. Maybe it's the system itself, and so the system itself can sometimes result in a, a parent being alienated from a child uh, based on a variety of factors. But when that happens, you're going to see the child uh, exhibit poor health. You're going to see the child exhibit emotional problems. You're going to see this, the child exhibit uh, trouble with problem solving. You're going to see lower academic performance, increased danger of dropping out of school, uh, and then difficulties, as we talked about, with relationships and even retaining employment or marriages in the future. Um, those are things we're going to, you're going to be able to point to and say, here are some factors that are impacted as a result of child not having a relationship with, with both parents like they should have. As we talk about father-child relationships, especially, and I wanna, I'm going to focus, as I have been, on the fa father-child relationships in question, but the negative impacts on on daughters uh, is is something that I think gets lost in the shuffle. It's something that that in our practice we point to and we we make sure to stress because too often I think it, the default is well it's a daughter daughter needs to go with mom that's um, that just makes sense send the boys with dad send the girls with mom call it good. Um, that's a terrible mentality and one as a as a father of uh, a daughter that I it 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 makes no sense whatsoever to even think like that. Um, female children 
generally experience more negative long-term repercussions uh, when they're in a divorced family versus non-divorced families. So we can point to empirical data and show that daughters uh, are going to have problems with when they are uh, in a divorce setting, and they're, if, especially if they do not have that relationship with father that they need. Um, children will always align with the parent who's going to clearly meet their needs. And one of the things that we look at in parental alienation cases is the alienating parent going out of their way to create an environment that caters to the child. And are they never telling the child no? Are they giving in to the child's demands? Those are things that any child, if you, if, if, if my wife says, no, you're not going to get to have an, a cookie. And I say, sure, you can have a cookie. Kids are going to run to me because they're going to know they're going to get a cookie. And so the same applies in this setting. Uh, children are going to go where their, their needs are met. And those needs may not be in their best interest. And that's one of the things that, that everybody needs to keep in mind. So um, as I talked about, and we're talking about it in the, the conference in the fall, poor custody decisions themselves can sometimes contribute to the alienation of a child. Poor custody decisions and limited time with the parent can have just as harsh an impact on the emotional and psychological toll uh, than, than just true alienation by a, a alienating parent. And so um, it can, a bad custody decision, meaning very limited time with father, uh, very limited time with mother, uh, either, either case could have a significant impact on the child, just like um, they're not even having a relationship with that parent. And so um, that's what, that's one of the things that uh, we'll talk about in the fall. Uh, I don't want to go that into it in great detail because I'll talk about that in the future, but um, parents need to ask themselves whose needs are met by this action. Uh, uh, that's the, the, when we're talking about parental alienation, we're talking about family law cases, we're talking about custody cases, uh, the negative impact is significant. Uh, you know, believing negative attributes about a parent, if you believe that your mom or dad is bad, that's going to have a significant impact on your psyche. Uh, the resistance or rejection of that target parent, that uh, inability to have that relationship that's needed, that's going to have a significant impact on that child. The development of mistrust that comes with parental alienation, those are things that are going to uh, have a negative impact on the child. So ask whose needs are being met. And if that parent can't say, look, the child's needs are being met here, uh, then obviously they need to think again about the path that they're taking. And, and frankly, more attorneys need to be asking the question, whose needs are being met by this action? Um, and, and consider the action that's being taken as it relates to the children in this situation. Um, fathers are, as I've said, primary targets for parental alienation. There, there's no question. You're going to see it more times than not. If there's an alienation issue, the target parent is going to be dad. But we need to talk about the fact that the impact on those children as a result of that is the, that is the thing. That is the thing that has to be understood. More people need to be educated about it. Uh, as a, an attorney that is a father myself, represents fathers, um, I will go to the, to the ends of the earth to uh, advocate on behalf of good dads, uh, because empirical studies have consistently shown that children suffer emotionally, academically, and developmentally when they don't have a close relationship with their father post-divorce during their childhood. Their math scores, their reading scores, their, uh, their social skills, uh, emotionality, those are all going to be impacted and affected post-divorce if they do not have a relationship with their dad. Um, girls, as we've talked about, if they don't feel close to dad, they're going to have a lower self-esteem, they're at greater risk of depression, um, and they're going to have academic issues just like their brothers if they don't have a relationship with their dad. Um, that, is, that is empirical, and we can point to uh, studies that can, that can point to that. 
as it relates to boys, boys are going to suffer in the areas of self-control. They're going to sleep, motivation. Um, these are things that you're going to see. If they're being raised by their moms exclusively, you're going to see issues that are going to be uh, unique to the boy uh, who's living with their mom versus boys who live with the father post-divorce. I mean, this is something that a lot of people do not want to talk about. Um, and it's controversial. You don't make any friends by saying it, uh, but when boys are not living with their dad or boys are living exclusively with mom and they're not having a joint relationship with both mom and dad, there's going to be a significant impact on those kids. Um, and so the, that that's something we, we need to look at. Um, we can no longer systematically disenfranchise fathers uh, by not giving them equal time with their children. And it's not good for kids. The relationship between father and child um, needs to be a quality relationship. Okay, that, that's another empirical determination that a poor quality relationship between father and child, uh, it does not have the same impact as a good relationship. And when we say quality, we're talking about quality time. So the quality, the quality of the relationship trumps the quantity of the time that you have with the child. And, and so when we're talking about what can you do, we're talking about is the relationship such that you're able to create uh, normalcy, that you're able to participate in the the day-to-day -day events, waking them up and making breakfast, packing their lunch and taking them to school, uh, picking them up from school and taking them for ice cream, getting them home and doing their homework, uh, giving them dinner, brushing their teeth, getting them bathed, putting them in bed, reading them a story. Uh, these are things that become the accoutrements of life that define a quality relationship between a father and a child and are so critical to the well-being of those of the children that if you take that away from the child, you are going to hurt that child. I'll say it again. If you're going to take those things away from the child, you're going to hurt that child. Um, so that's why it is so critical that our courts lower the barrier to fathers to have the relationship with their children, as opposed to becoming an obstacle. You're going to, you're going to, and, and I know I live in a world where we talk to a lot of parents, fathers specifically, who feel like that as they go through this family law system, the barrier to their relationship with their children gets higher and higher and higher and higher as opposed to becoming easier and easier and easier for them to be the dads they want to be that's a problem um there's a study a 1990 study there's another study out of uh, in 1986 study I'm happy to give you the citations if you want to email me um that found that more frequent visitation uh with father was actually associated with fewer adjustment problems um even when parent conflict was high, uh, more contact with father was better. Uh, there's another 2007 study that found that the long-term effects of parent conflict uh, and parenting time uh, was mediated. So the, the conflict between the parents was mediated when the relationship with father was good. Uh, and so there, there's empirical evidence after empirical evidence to support the fact that the relationship uh, with dad needs to needs to be there, even when there's a high conflict custody case, even when there's a high conflict divorce case. In our jurisdiction in Oklahoma, we separate custody and visitation, and you can have and I and I we tell our clients all the time, there are two mutually exclusive issues. You can have full custody and not have 50-50 time. You can, or I'm sorry, you can have full custody and have 50-50 time. You can have joint custody and not have it. So they're, they're two different things. If you can't make decisions together, that does that should not impact the ability of a parent to spend the time with a child. And, and too often, I think that, that gets they get lumped together so that if you can't communicate with the other parent, you're not able to then have the time with the child because we're going to associate custody and parenting time uh, 
with one another in too many cases. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it happens. I'm surprised every once in a while. But I think in, all in all, when we're seeing one child get one parent get full custody of a child, the, the typical visitation schedule uh, results in, in something other than 50-50 equal time. It's a lot. We're throwing a lot, lot out there. Um, there is there there have been empirical studies after um, as late as 2007 that have found the beneficial the father child relationship uh, provides a benefit to the children that that is unique from the mother child relationship, especially father daughter relationships. Um, those have been studied at length. And the outcomes of those studies uh, are particularly important as it relates to the long-term well-being of our daughters. Um, I, I'll just tell you that numerous studies show that women who have reported a close relationship with their father during their childhood developed strong sense of personal identity, positive self-esteem, as well as enjoying a greater confidence in their relationship with other men. And um, I'll point to a book, um, Father Hunger, um, which I, I think I recommend oftentimes by Margo, Dr. Margo Main. Um, I cite to it in some briefing that we do that relate when we're talking about father child relationships uh, with daughters and parents, daughters and fathers. Um, Dr. Main points out, and, and I'll quote her, that it is crucial that the times come to focus on the positive and crucial role that fathers can play in their daughters, emerging identity and self-esteem. Um, she, she talks about the numerous studies that have shown that the, uh, that a woman's personal identity, her self-esteem, her en enjoying uh, life can point to the relationship which she had with her father uh, when she was younger. So it it points to and, and it supports the contention that it is critical for the children's well-being for fathers to be involved in their lives. And so um, without it, uh, you're going to see um, you're going to see continued negative impact. Um, you know, uh, I can point to other studies empirically um, that suggest that children who have great relationships or good relationships with their fathers uh, or their fathers are involved in their lives have a higher cognitive and developmental function. They're great. They have greater empathy, which I think is something that doesn't that gets lost uh, in this conversation is the the idea that you're more emotionally intelligent. You have more empathy uh, with a, when you have a good relationship with your father. Uh, there's a stronger internal locus of control and the, that these children have because they have a good relationship with their father. Um, these are these are empirical studies that these are this is not a lawyer just coming in here and arguing something. These are things that um, academically have been shown to point to the fact that if you are a parent, who has been alienated from their child, the impact on that child is, is significant in a way that is not recognized by too many within our system. Um, whereas when a child is allowed to have a relationship with their father and, and even their mother, um, they're more likely to be emotionally secure, be confident, um, as they grow older, they're going to be more inquisitive and have better social connections. And so the, the, the impact is so significant that I think that the issue is becoming more and more one that we cannot, um, we cannot just leave to our family court system. Uh, this needs to be a larger conversation from a policy perspective uh, that is being had across this country as far as the relationships between children, because by and large, um, very few states have a presumption for equal parenting. And we can talk more about that, but there's very few states that have a presumption for equal parenting. 
uh, that gets enforced. Uh, I'll, I'll say in, in Oklahoma, we are trying to move more in that direction, but until our appellate courts start to support the direction that's it, where it's going, our judges aren't enforcing those laws like we would like to see them. So um, it's going to take a, a number of, of moving parts uh, that, that have to come together. Um, I want to point out there is a study from 2007. There's a 2004, 2000 study, 2004 and a 2007 study um, that talks about the, the parental, the uh, standard visitation schedules. Uh, many states, most states, if not all states, all the states where I practice have a standard visitation schedule. They're, they're, uh, most of the time, it's alternating weekends. In Oklahoma, you're going to see most counties are going to have their own standard visitation schedule, but it's going to look something like it every other weekend, pick up Friday, drop off on Monday, or pick up Thursday, drop off on Monday uh, schedule so that the non-custodial uh, parent has visitation every other Friday to Monday. Uh, in Texas, standard schedule is first, third, and fifth weekends. Um, with an, uh, a midweek. And so you're going to see something along those lines in most states. It's going to vary uh, occasionally, but that's going to be the what we're going to call the standard visitation schedule. Uh, Kelly and Lamb in studies in 07 and 04, uh, they weighed in on this topic and said that's not enough. It's too little. So even in cases in which you're not seeing true parental alienation, meaning, um, and when I say true parental alienation, I mean, we're, we're talking no time with dad, there, there's something's occurred, there's complete rejection, um, there, there's, there's no uh, effort here to um, be able to reconcile parent and child. That's what I would consider total alienation um, in the severest sense. We're talking about this is this is in cases where you have good relationships. I mean, I we we often and, and it's I'm glad to say it's it's probably happening fewer and fewer times, but we'll see good parents, good relationships, and there and we're still dealing with every other weekend visitation. Um, people sometimes it doesn't we don't want to change it for whatever reason. Maybe it's financial, maybe it's time, maybe it's employment. But every other weekend, uh, Kelly and Lamb are saying that that in and of itself, that's not enough. So every other weekend visitation is not enough to have that that relationship that we talked about that had all of the accoutrements of life, that you're waking them up and you're putting them to bed. You're going through the process. You're you're enjoying the fact that some of the most significant conversations that you have with your children may happen in the drop off and pick up line in, in, in elementary school that you're able to make sure they're brushing their teeth and you're able to catch those conversations that happen in between life happening that allow you as a father or a mother to be able to really kind of connect with that child. And, and when you don't have those opportunities, except for every other weekend, that's not enough. Um, it's too little. And so uh, empirically, we've we've seen support for the fact that we really do need to move to a more uh, standardized 50-50 schedule that would allow for fathers, mothers, both to have an opportunity to live with their children in a way that's going to give them that connection. Um, there's a study um, came out in 1987 that talks about the fact that uh, when we're talking about those quality relationships, that that you need that extensive and regular interaction, that you need the the time distribution to be able to allow you those 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 interactions, those rituals, those transitions, um, those things that happen during the day, that that is in the best interest of the children to have those things. And when you're picking them up on Friday after school, and you're getting them Friday night. And Saturday night, maybe Sunday night, and it's a weekend, and you're not taking them really to school, but one time, you're not getting those rituals, you're not getting those things, you're not picking them up from school, you're not getting those opportunities in that way. And that that's where um, 
we we see studies who have who that which suggest that that needs to change that we need to do more um that there's an emerging consensus um that at least at least one third time is necessary to be able to have the impact that is going to benefit the child and that it needs to be it will increase in a crew up to equal time so at least one third time uh it needs to be up to 50 50 so that's that's where we um you know we are advocating for more equality in our practice uh parental equality across the board uh because we believe that that both parents do matter in the lives of their children there's there's a lot of empirical study and research relating to this issue of of what is necessary to be able to have that impactful relationship post-divorce when in a custody arrangement you know what is the best interest of the child and if the best interest of the child is have is to have a quality relationship with both parents then the empirical research would suggest that both parents need the opportunity to uh, you know have the quality time and and the ideal schedule uh, would allow the children to have opportunities to interact frequently with both parents uh, in a variety of, of functional contexts. Um, we're talking about feeding, playing, disciplining, basic care, limit setting, putting to bed. And limit setting is, is from a disciplinary standpoint, um, it's critical. If, you, if you're not able to discipline the child, you're not going to have that same relationship um, as the other parent. And so you're not going to have that quality of, of, of time that's, that is there. As we look at where we are today, when it relates to best interests of, child, of the children, and we look at parental alienation and the impact that it has on the parent-child relationship, but more importantly, what's the impact on kids uh, and the children who, are, who find themselves in these scenarios? Um, children do better when they maintain high quality relationships with both parents uh, children who are involved with dad experience much better results as it relates to academics behavior uh peer relationships all of those things that we've talked about um they're less emotional they're less uh difficult when the, than they are when they're living exclusively in a single parent home um and so you can look at empirical study and suggest that we need more time with both parents. Um, in 20 states, including the uh, District of Columbia, the most commonly awarded uh, custody or visitation schedule uh, is equal time. So there are states out there, 20, at least 20 of them in one study that suggests, you know, 50-50 time is, is more normal than not. Um, 30 states have a default presumption for shared placement, but below 50%. Um, I'm, I'm sad to say uh, Oklahoma is one of the three worst states as it relates to shared parenting. Uh, and one, you know, we, we're right there with Mississippi and Tennessee, who are the three um, worst offenders. And we're trying, we're doing what we can, but uh, I, 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 I like to tell people, I feel like that we're in the, we're in the, uh, well, I'll just say comment. We're, we're a state that needs a lot of help as it relates to parental equality and making sure that both parents get treated fairly. Um, what can we do uh, as we, as we finish this? One of the things that as parents, we need to make sure that we are engaging in the relationship with the kids. If you're a father who's who's being alienated, don't give up. If you're a mother who's being alienated, don't give up. Um, the The CDC came out with a list of of parenting practices that are associated with positive child outcomes, um, and they include things such as contingent responsiveness, meaning child smiles at you smile back engage with that child on their level make sure that you're able to communicate with them in a way that they understand um, show warmth and sensitivity to the child 
don't be cold. Uh, I will say that a lot of times you're going to see um, in custody cases, there, there, there can be a coldness and a, and a harshness to one of the parents that, that comes out and children don't respond well to that. And there, there's no doubt about that. Um, make sure that you maintain routines, that, that you limit household chaos. Those, that's something that uh, the CDC suggests is going to be associated with a positive child outcome. Um, one thing that I will say that is probably a no-brainer, um, talk to your kids, read them books, make sure that you're reading to them, um, practice you know, good health and nutrition, safety. Those are things that are associated with positive outcomes. Um, and then finally, use appropriate discipline. Discipline them, but do it appropriately. That's th those are things that the CDC, uh, working with the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, have come out with and said, parents, these are things that you need to think about in terms of positive outcomes for kids. Um, and most of this research, I'll say, is related to mothers. Most of the research on the, that is out there is relating related to the mother-child relationship. There's not as much father-child relationship, and there's even less of grandparent-child uh, relationship studies. And so those are things that, that we need to see more of um, and, you know, be mindful of as we, as we look at this. But I, I think that we are in a place in this, in this country where a conversation is taking place about the role of fathers that I, I, I'm glad to see. I think that we are starting to recognize the fact, at least academically, that fathers are playing a more significant role in the lives of their children today than they did a generation ago, and much, much more than they did many generations ago, and that the role of father is evolving, but and that is becoming more and more critical. And as we see more studies that are coming out to suggest that if you're going, if you take away the role, if you take away father from the lives of the child, you're going to see empirical negative impact on that child and so when you're talking about parental alienation you're talking about negatively impacting that child and if we're going to associate abuse with having a negative physical emotional psychological or even academic impact on a child there are a few things that are more significant or more empirically studied than taking the parent or taking the father out of the home by whatever means, whether it's a, 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 a alienating parent turning a child against the father or whether it's a court entering a custody or visitation schedule that doesn't allow the father the time that they would like to have with their children. Um, if we're going to continue to do that we're going to continue to see this cycle continue and we're going to see uh, this generation raise children who are going to repeat the cycle in the next generation to come and we're going to continue to see this and it's going to continue to impact uh, society in a negative way and and but even more granularly it's going to continue to impact children in a negative way whenever they don't get to have a relationship with both parents. And so, um, as you can tell, I, I am very passionate about protecting parent-child relationship for both the child and the parent. And, and I want good parents to get the opportunity to parent the children in a way that allows them to provide that child with an opportunity to do better than they did. Uh, and provides the child an opportunity to to grow and to to be um, the child that it can grow into. Uh, that child can grow into. Um, both parents matter in the lives of a child. This is not about father's rights or mother's rights. This is about the child's rights and what the child has a right to in terms of having a relationship with both parents. And and so we we need to identify, call it what it is. We need to identify the alienating behavior. We need to nip it in the bud early and make sure that we're doing something about it before it gets out of hand. And we need to help the child to transition into a relationship with both parents that will allow that child to get the benefit of the father-child time and mother-child time. 
And if there is a problem, uh, if that's not possible, then we need to absolutely look at the empirical studies that are staring us in the face as to the impact of on a child if you take a father out of the home. And we need to make sure that we're referencing those things and looking at those things and not being scared to talk about the fact that if you're going to take that child that, that child away from father and you're not going to allow them that relationship, you're going to be dealing with an issue um, that's on your hands uh, as a system, as a society. And so I, I hope that we'll take a look at this. I hope that um, that provides a little bit of guidance, a little bit of insight as to how we approach these cases as attorneys. We, we look at the impact from an empirical perspective. Every case is different. And I, I had a mentor years and years and years and years ago who used to say, uh, a family law case is like a snowflake. No two are alike. And that's true because there are no two people alike. And when you put two people together, you're absolutely, there's no two relationships alike. And so when you have that dynamic, you're dealing with unique, a unique set of circumstances in every case. And what we want to be able to, uh, to do is to take what we know and the empirical research that's been done and apply it to these unique set of facts and circumstances as best we can and try to develop a way to move forward so that both parents get to have a relationship with their children. When we start identifying the fact that one parent is trying to alienate another parent, or one parent is trying to trump the relationship of the other parent, uh, we have to step in and that's where the courts have to make a decision. And the courts have to be um, mindful of, of the fact that both parents should be entitled to the same protections. I hope and pray that our judiciary will pay attention to the empirical research that gets put in front of them. I know that we put it in front of judges as far as a lot of the material you saw here today, we're putting that in front of judges in the form of briefs and in form of expert opinions and different things. Um, and I hope that the judiciary will start to pay attention to those things and listen to the fact that if you're going to take fathers out of the home, whether it be through parental alienation, whether it be through just poor custody decisions, uh, you're going to you're going to very negatively impact those children. And so, um, my, again, my name is Chris Smith. Again, if you have any questions about the material that I've provided, if you're asking about any of the uh, research that I've referenced, I, I did not cite to those things for purposes of uh, just the conversation. Uh, but I am happy to provide any any uh, research citations, anything that I've referenced, anything of any material that I, I've I've used. I'll tell you a couple of things that I a couple of books that have material, a lot of good material as a jumping off place. And I'll I'll be done after this. One is um, collateral damage. Um, I know there's a lot of um, a lot of folks that have. have reference this as far as it's a great book for um, anyone interested in the impact uh, that they are having on a child in a divorce and whether it's for parents um, and, and it's written for parents it's written on behalf of uh, for parents to be able to identify what they can do to help their children and what they can do and, and it's it's good material for parents who are looking at the situation and asking, you know, am I doing this for me or am I doing this for the child? And and how can I do better? Um, collateral, dam collateral damage. Um, and then Warren Farrell's uh, Father and Child Reunion, another uh, great book. I, I appreciate Warren Farrell, Dr. Farrell and his work. Um, and so that's where some of the material came from today. And then uh, I, I think I mentioned uh, Father Hunger by Margot Main, and I've got some other material out there. A lot of it's from academic uh, research. And so if you have specific questions about any of it, I'm happy to uh, respond as quick as I can. And uh, as, as, you know, if you need anything from me, my email and contact information will be available. And so I wish everybody the best of luck.